and I'm going to talk a bit about inheritance, and I'm going to see in a minute what, what that means, and focusing more on the thermal and thermomechanical configuration, and try to get a, a critical review on what we can learn from heat flow, thermal, on the geodynamic consequences. Good. Uh, Why well we are interested from uh, the dynamic point of view in terms of temperature or in thermal configuration and so forth is that because we know that there's a correlation between the mechanical strengths of the plate and the thermal and the thermal configuration of the plate itself. That's nothing new. Uh, that basically comes with a classical concept. We already discussed about that. Some of the talks have been discussing that. Uh, dates back in the late 70s, and that's just a um, representation of that. The, the theory and the concept is pretty easy in that sense. You look at rocks as fluid, thermodynamically uh, dissipative fluid, and that basically that's the way you approximate on geological time scale the rock. Uh, that basically, since you, you deal with this uh, thermodynamic and this dissipation thermodynamic in, in the end, what you end up is that you can relate the peak in the strength of the rock to some peak in the dissipation potential, or let's say entropy production, that basically means. And that's basically what you see in here, and that provides you the transition between whether the rock will fail in a brittle or will just creep at a certain point where you just reach the maximum dissipation that you can actually have. Uh, if you look at that kind of view, basically what you end up is this kind of, let's say, Christmas trees, what they call in the genomic community. And what you notice is that you get a kind of rather sharp transition in there. And that's because there are some assumptions in deriving that basically uh, everything is accumulated in a dissipative sense by creep, and that basically provides you the, the sharp peak uh, or the sharp transition in here. And then, of course, creep is thermally activated, and that comes then basically the feedback that we have. Um, uh, that basically is an assumption, as I said. It works in principle. We discussed in a couple of papers also the limitation of looking at only dissipative while you actually. Uh, you can include a bit more on the thermodynamic of the, of the rock itself and then arrive at the better constraints also the amount of elastic strain that is actually released. And that basically what it does is that you won't get this kind of sharp transition. It's basically you would actually start considering that you have a, thi a certain thickness of the material that behaves in a semi brick or semi ductal But that basically doesn't change too much the, the picture in here. What is matter is that this transition in here, call it the brittle ductile transition, that provides a conservative estimate of the seismogenic depth. And that's what we are interested in. Basically, it provides you with a conservative estimate of the, 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 the elastic strength of the lithosphere, basically. And since it that, then basically, uh, since, it, since this step is related to the to creep, the dissipation, to energy dissipation, and this is thermally activated exponentially. Uh, it should come in here also a volumetric term, but that doesn't matter. It should be entropy, not, uh, not ter temperature as well. Uh, what you can back correlate is the seismogenic depths to a specific isotherm. And you find basically in laboratory then this isotherm that identifies these peaks basically are typical isotherms that also bound the phase transition of the most abundant minerals in, uh, in the rock. That basically, the, what, we, what, we, what, we, what we know from geodynamic. When, when, when you do that, basically that's laboratory experiment, that's theory behind, then you start to look at data. And of course, what you, what you can do, you start simple. You start with oceanic lithosphere, where we know that there's a fairly constrained correlation between the time and the, and the mechanical thickness of the, of the lithosphere. We know that basically the thermal age goes with the inverse of the square root of time. That's basically what is plotting here. And when you do cross plot on top of that, basically seismicity, what you would see is basically that all the earthquakes seems to be confined to specific uh, temperature, isotherms. 
that basically it's a potential temperature of around 600 degree that corresponds to a material temperature between 600 and 800 basically. And that's basically only true, also true when you look at young oceanic lithosphere, when you do have a rather scatter, um, basically gradient, but still this relation holds basically. And what is the indication that we can derive from that is that it seems that the strengths of the it's not continental, it should be oceanic lithosphere, might be controlled by the geotherm. And what I mean by geotherm is not only temperature, but also composition, basically. Then what you do, basically you do a step further, and you try to see whether there's a correlation between heat flow and, and the, the thermal age. And then you see, basically, you, this, you get the, the typical plot. There was something that was done even before this paper. I think this paper only corrected uh, the, 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 uh, the earliest results. Uh, in the end, what you find is that there's a correlation, indeed, between surface heat flow and the thermal age. So the conclusion that you can derive when you look at the oceanic lithosphere is that then basically the surface heat flow might be representative of the, the full thermal configuration. And that basically can provide you also with a proxy of the rheology of the lithosphere, because basically this is thermally activated. Well, then uh, you do the same for the continent, and then the, the thing starts to change a bit. Uh, that's a paper in 2011, well, there was a paper in 2011. What they do is basically it's completely the same uh, kind of exercise that I showed you before for the oceanic lithosphere. What they cross plot is the elastic thickness with, uh, let's say, a change in the, in the seismic uh, velocity anomaly. This picture is taken at uh, uh, under kilometer depth. And what you see is basically that there's a correlation between seismic velocity, elastic thickness. And what you, what you derive here is basically that those two parameters basically should also be sensitive to the same parameter, set of parameters. And we know basically that seismic velocity depends on temperature and composition, basically geotherm. So the, the conclusion that you derive from here is that even the elastic thickness, that basically the proxy for the lithospheric strength should also depend on the geotherm. Then you do the same exercise, same paper. What they do is then, then cross plot elastic thickness and heat flow, and that's no correlation. Then basically what this paper concludes is that for continents, heat flow may not be representative of the thermal configuration of the lithosphere, of the plate. And therefore we cannot use that as a proxy for the logical con uh, configuration. That's what we are interested in. They, um, that comes to, I mean, uh, some years later, completely independently, we also did some exercise and we were investigating the, uh, let's say, thermal configuration, mechanical stability uh, in Central and Northern Europe. What you see in here is a, a, just a plot of a cross-section cross that is coming through here and I'm color coding the contribution of the total heat flow from the different component. And the conclusion that you arrive is completely the same as for the paper that I showed you before. What we actually arrive here is that we see that the heat flow is a composite signal that basically provides you with an indication that is a poor proxy for the deeper component. And uh, if you look at the details here, basically what you actually realize is that the mental heat flow is sum up about one third of the total surface that we have and the most significant contribution comes from the crust. And that basically uh, correlates with the thickness of the crust, but also with the basement and also with the upper crustal generation. That's basically something that heat flow as a measurement does not take into account. And that was the same conclusion of this paper that we arrived. So come basically to the most important slides of my talk. So if we, if we, if we, if we want to arrive at uh, quantifying some implication in terms of geodynamics, then what is really important in this sense is start considering also the role that inheritance, tectonics, geology might actually have. What we know is that the present day of continental lithosphere is to a certain degree controlled by pre-existing structure and that basically those are being acquired during the tectonic events tectonic inheritance that predates fault reactivation, basically, results from 
uh, diverse processes that uh, include stress localization, shear, and so forth, that are all manifested at all scales. And if we talk about lithosphere control, then we need to look at the geological makeup of the plate, thickness, thermal age, composition, and so forth, and also the, let's say, causative tectonic processes. And we also have some, uh, in a, some, of course, grain scale control, so local scale, and that basically goes into local environment, composition, gray sites, fluids, preserved melts, and so forth. In a nutshell, basically, what we want to say is that heat flow alone may not be fully representative of the configuration in terms of the logical and mechanics of the continental plates, and this is also true for intraplate system. And basically, what we need to do is also to integrate the heterogeneity that we see in the lithosphere together with observation and from different and also sources. So since I have uh, five minutes, that's right. So I just go through uh, a couple of examples and show you the, 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 the role that inheritance, geology, though it's complex actually have. That's a study that we did in uh, the upper region. We are so in southern Germany. Here you see on the, on the left the uh, seismic catalog, so it's all natural seismicity, and on the right side of the picture is basically a computed, uh, integrated crustal uh, strength of the, of the, of the crust, uh, based on a thermomechanical model that we have. And what you say is that you can start uh, in, uh, looking at some correlation between the strength of the crust, or of the plate that you're actually in, with the location of the different seismic events. What you actually have is that you have high frequency of low to intermediate events, look at the color here, where we do expect where you do have the crust is weak, and that basically just beneath the graben. And then you also have some high magnitude events, for example here, where you do have rheologically competent domains. So basically what you actually have is that the magnitudes, hypocenter depths, they also correlate to some degree, and they do correlate also to the, le the, the amount of mechanical coupling between the crust and the mantle. What you get, actually, what we did also here is to compute the seismogenic thickness that we derive from the observation. This is the, the one on the, on the left. And then we, we correlate to, let's say, a proxy for the integrated strengths. In this case, it's the mechanical thickness. And what you see is that despite that we are dealing with a large variation from 5 to 50 kilometers, the trend basically is resembled. We have some regional features. So there's a correlation, if not a control, between seismicity, depth, spatial correlation, and also the mechanical response of the, of the, of the plate. We did the same exercise in a completely different region. This is the Andean subduction zone. And basically, we were looking in a study with a PhD that just finished at this part of the Andes. And we did completely the same. We take a model, we start thermomechanically, integrate all the data, integrate the data from seismic tomography and so forth, and we arrive at a full 3D thermological model. Uh, what I'm showing you here is just cross-section here. This is the, the differential stress, basically, that you see. Uh, the, the green color curve indicates the, the MO boundary, or the, uh, the BDT, sorry, and that's the, 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 um, the red curves indicates in both of them the, the, the MO boundary. And what you see is basically it's color coding on top are the seismicity that we observe, and there's again a correlation between the rheology and seismicity. Basically, we found that the BDT is really bounding the extent of the seismogenic zone, and then you do have shallowing of events where you start actually having weakening. And this is actually occurring when you get the crustal rot of the origin. And we have a study that goes from the Baetics up to the Himalayan that shows the same trend. You get the origin, the origin is weak, and there basically you get shallowing of seismicity. While if you go to and if you move to the foreland, then you get stronger, and then seismicity gets to the entire crust, basically. There's also an additional role of the, of the subducting slab, but uh, we're not showing that. The good part, and that's the last slide, I promise, is that then if you look instead of the continental plate, you look at the oceanic plate seismicity, which is basically the one on the plate in here, what you see is that there's no correlation any longer now to the, to the basic thermomechanical state. And what we expect to hear, basically, is to have seismicity 
something within an overly ductile material. We know that might be possible, only know about one situation where they see a seismicity or a seismic events in a ductile material. And that came to uh, the point that we actually need to start considering not only the large scale makeup, but also additional roles. And that basically what we state in this paper, where uh, we, can, we should consider for, in order to understand the seismicity in the plate, basically embrittlement of the plate itself because of release of fluids that might be mediated either to consolidation of the sediments in the upper part or to metamorphic reaction. And this is basically just a, cross, uh, a plot of the ratio where uh, basically what you see is that seismicity stays within hydrated mental conditions so presence of fluids and that basically might be the triggering of seismicity in this case. That's it, sorry.